season. We're really excited. Yes, applause. Please. And this year, our pre-marathon events have a, a bit of a focus on women and women's relationship to the book. So we're starting off, of course, today with uh, Susan Merrill, but let me tell you about a couple of other events that you can join us at going coming forward. Uh, on April 20th, at 6 p.m. on Zoom, we're having the author of Ahab's Wife uh, in discussion. Her name is Sina Jeter Nasland, and she'll be in discussion with Paul Bresnik, who is a, her literary agent, who is in the room with us, and one of our stalwart Moby crew members for the marathon. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> then on May 25, a Thursday evening at 6 o'clock, at the library, we're going to be hosting the videographer, photographer, Galen Rosenwalks, and uh, the ecologist Carl Safina, and their discussion is going to be about among whales in the wild, because they have all studied whales in their habitat. So that, and that we will see videos of whales as well that evening. That's April, uh, excuse me, May 25 at 6 p.m. And then the next event, we don't have a date yet, but June Gervais, who is here with us, and the author of uh, <clears throat> Jobs for Girls with Artistic Flair, will be in discussion with a tattoo artist. And we will have temporary tattoos to distribute as well. So to really get in, you know, we, we, if we're going to go on board for the voyage, we have to have at least one tattoo. <laughs> yeah, right. Temporary though it may be. Uh, and then when the marathon is on board uh, here, at the store, Scott Blue Dorn, Blue Dorn rather's artwork will be on the walls. And Scott has done a lot of amazing work about whales and about Moby Dick over the course of his career. He's one of the most talented local East End artists that we have out here. So that's the pre-marathon events. The marathon itself is June 9 to the 11th. Um, you can sign up to get the actual uh, details about how to read and how to fund, you know, join our fundraiser. And there's actually this flyers are around the store, so you can just scan the codes there, and, or you can just photograph the flyer and have all the information to take with you. Okay. So anyway, we're thrilled that, you know, we've often wanted to get Susan Merrill to talk about Moby Dick because she is like one of our local experts on the book. And so when I mentioned to her that we were coming to talk, that we wanted to kind of focus on women in Moby Dick this year, she was like, I'm all in, I'm all there. And she gave a most compelling description of her talk, which I'm just going to quote her, because I think it really represents what we'll be in conversation with about this evening. So uh, Susie says that Moby Dick is the everything, everywhere, all at once of American <laughs> literature. <laughs> it takes a writer, right? I mean, come on. Uh, a supremely gripping look at the chaotic mix of morality, integrity, othering, invading, caretaking, and love for both self and other that characterizes the American experience. Um, in other words, the book is everything that we are and well worth the effort to examine it. So we will look at how to tackle the challenging experimental novel and to find where the women's vision is in this womanless world of the whaling ship. It's there for the taking, and as Susan says, we hope that you will join us. If you haven't already uh, had the pleasure of meeting Susie Merrill, uh, Susan Scarf Merrill is a writer. Uh, she's published several novels, including Shirley, a novel that was turned into a major feature film. She teaches in the creative writing program at Stony Brook University. Um, so she's an educator, um, she's a Sag Harbor local, and she's a writer. What could be better for Moby Dick and, and, and Canios and Susie Merrill? Please, a warm welcome. Okay, I'm, I'll be. I'll do standing. Um, hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be here, and um, I always love being in this room. You want something? Hit? Any more chairs in the back? Um, oh yeah, I can get more chairs. Okay, okay. I'll continue. Um, so I did not expect some. I expected like four people. So <laughs> I'm really surprised. Oh, ye of little faith. <laughs> I know. Come on. It's I know. Well, it's it's a it's a big 
difficult book, and um, I'm really glad that all of you are um, take, having the courage to start this journey, because I think it's quite wonderful experience if you can allow yourself to do it. So I'm curious about how many of you have finished the book. <laughs> well, long time ago. And how many of you have started the book? Okay, and how many of you have just looked at it? <laughs> okay, so we are, we are really, we are, we are actually stalwarts here. So that's really fabulous. I don't want to do a, um, a me standing up here lecture. If you have a question or a thought, thoughts are welcome. Just go like this. Let's just dialogue because this conversation is part of how one tackles this book. This is a book that you have to talk about or you can't get through it. It's really, you must be open to the idea of the question. So I'm here to answer your questions. And I'm going to start by just saying, telling you some things that um, I think some of the people in this room know about the life of this book and its author, but very little. And then um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what it's like to teach this book. And then I'm going to kind of bring you into the idea that you as women or friends of women or people who have found this book difficult in the past might find a way in to it. OK, so first of all, Herman Melville was born in 1819 to a very uh, well-to-do New York family. They were, um, they were. His father was a, a sold dry goods. They, they both. He, his father and mother were, of, um, of kind of American history families. The Gansevoorts and the Melvilles. One, his grandfather was actually dressed up as an Indian at the Boston Tea Party. I mean, they they had been around forever. When he was 11, his father moved the family to Albany, New York for a business opportunity. Uh, it was a disaster. They lost pretty much everything. The father died. Um, yeah, yeah, not great, right? No. Yeah, and he was the second son. So, um, so uh, his brother Gansevoort uh, took over what was left of the father's business and ran it even further into the ground. Um, yeah, so so it's a story of business success, like all readers, you know. And um, so so when he was 19, he so he dropped out of school at 11. Or, yeah, but he's when you read the book, you can't believe it. He's completely self-educated, you know. And he actually taught school in his teens. So it tells you that though he had not finished school, he was deemed worthy of teaching it. When he was 19 or 20, he got on a boat, a merchant ship. There was, he needed money, he needed to make a living. He got on a boat, he sailed in various capacities for about five years. So from the age of, let's say he came back here at the age of 25. And among the experiences that he had had, he had been in the Navy, he had um, abandoned, a, oh God, I've lost the word. What's the word when you run away from your ship? Mutiny. He, no. 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 Deserter. Oh, deserted. He deserted. deserted. Thank deserted. you. Sorry. <laughs> Words. Um, so he had deserted from one ship. He had um, been. He had lived among cannibals for a while. I mean, he had just had a huge number of weird and fascinating experiences. So he comes back to uh, to this country. He moves. He moves in with his family, and he writes first a book called Taipei, and then a book called Omu. And they were both about his experiences off in the islands. And they were a little bit, uh, they weren't dirty books, but they weren't clean books, <laughs> you know, for the time. So these, this is the 1840s. He, you know, was writing about you know, bare-breasted natives and being, you know, women sort of taking the sailors into the, into the, uh, you know, into the forest, and just, they were titillating books, and they, each of those books sold about 10,000 copies, which was quite good. It would also be pretty good now, you know, <laughs> so, you know, so, um, so then he wrote three more books, 
and each of those, this guy is starting to emerge. They're a little more thematic, they're a little darker, they're a little bit more cerebral, his voice is different. I mean, he's just starting to become the Herman Melville that wrote this book. And so at, at the age of 30, he moves, he's married, I actually can't remember, he has children, I'm pretty sure, but mm -hmm. don't quote me. Yeah, he does. He does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and he moves to the area of Massachusetts where Hawthorne is, and they become friends. And he's working on this story, which is a story that um, there, are, there are kind of two backstories for it. One is the sinking of the whale ship Essex, which Nathaniel Philbrick wrote about, and you should all read, it's quite wonderful. And the other is a, a weird little book that came out in, I think, eight, the mid-1820s, which is the story of Mocha Dick, a whale who eats a, who eats a boat. <coughs> so he has this backstory and this material, and he's writing a book that is pretty much the story of the whale, and he meets Hawthorne, and they start talking about what the book should be, and Hawthorne gets the, kind of, gives him the push to make, to make this more of a story about not just whaling, but about the larger issues, and at one point, um, he says, I think he, I think he writes to Hawthorne, I've written a wicked book. It takes him about a year and a half to write this book. It comes out in 1851 in London. <laughs> And I will now segue to the larger picture, which is that in the uh, <coughs> years from 1851 till his death in the 1890s, it sold 3,700 copies in total. Mm. So it didn't do very well. People didn't like it. They thought it was a weird book. And there are a couple of things that are important <coughs> to think about when you think about the fact that the book didn't matter so much in its own time in the way that it does now. And one is that this was a deeply religious, high church country. This was a country where everybody knew everything about their god, the god of, 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 um, of religion. And the stories that are in here and the references that are in here were easily accessible to everybody. It was a different <coughs> world than our world. So one of the challenges we face when we read this book is we don't know where Tophet is. And we may not know the story of Jonah and the whale. There are a lot of things that we might not know when we come to this book that were really accessible to and known to the people who originally read it. The 3,000 people who originally read it. <laughs> so something happened in the, you know, in the beginning of the sort of 1920s, late 19-teens, which was that a number of very famous authors in different, D.H. Lawrence, Faulkner, all started saying to people, this is the best book that ever was. This book is about everything. If there's a book, I think it's Faulkner who said, if there was a book that I wish I had written, it would be this book. Is that the World War I? Yeah. 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 Which made influence. Yeah, that's really true. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 that's great. That's great. Uh, please. Anything. Yeah. So, um, so the book suddenly has, you know, sort of transitioned from being a book that's basically forgotten to being this or text of our culture. And I, I want to segue from just that little backstory to saying I've taught this book, um, in fact, just this edition, just this paperback, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times, just this copy. Wow. Yeah, so I've taught this book a lot. And I will say that every time I teach it, we start out kind of 50-50, men, women, and by the end, most of the men have hung on. And if there's one woman left, <laughs> you know, she's just like, I'm just showing up because I like you. <laughs> about why this book is so tough for women. And um, I'm actually at some point going to ask Nick Gazzolo to say this beautiful thing. We're actually reading it in our little reading group right now. So that would be like 11 or something. And, um, and Nick said something the other night. We're quite early in the book. And he said something about the different kinds of music that 
uh, men and women find erotic, and he thinks that both those musics are in this book. But we're going to come back to it because I think it, I, I think we can't quite get there. Yet, but it's really it's just something to have in the back of your mind that there there are different musicalities in this book and different kinds of writing. But I think but I I want to say I think that the way to approach this book if you are not a person who wants to know everything about Wales that ever was, which is really what the book <coughs> seems like it's about on the surface, I mean, and actually feels like it's about when you're in it, is to think about the fact that this is a book that is told by the one survivor of a horrible, 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 horrible incident where everyone he knew and loved on this ship who he had been working with for a very long period of time dies and he is the one survivor. I'm not giving away anything that you don't know. Everybody knows this, right? So how can that be? How, how can I be the one person who is either an angel, like a dead person viewing this world and reporting on what happened in my experience, or even harder to understand in person who for whatever reason did not get taken by the whale. So when you think of this book, and I actually think I might have to give some credit to Nick and Renee also for this point I'm about to make, but when you think of this book as the result of a great trauma, when you think of this book as the result of having survived something, think about the way that when something awful happens to you, you start telling the story, you tell it over and over again, you keep coming at it from different points of view, you look up, you know, the brake pads on Toyotas, like you just have to find out everything to understand. This book is the book written by the guy who doesn't understand why he is still here to tell the story. So when you read the book with that sympathy in mind, you start to say, you start to be able to say, oh, I see. You can tell me about like how to peel the blubber from the whale, or you know, the the different paintings of whales that are in museums, or whatever it is. He's just trying to find a way to understand. A terribly <coughs> wonderful thing happened to him, and a terribly terrible thing happened to everyone around him. So if you approach every chapter by saying, why is Ishmael having to tell me this? I have sympathy for this poor guy. He has a mystery to solve. All of a sudden, the book is like your friend that you want to comfort. You want to be with mm. him. You want to help him understand it. So you're kind of a partner in his journey. And that changes the book. So that's my first piece of advice to you. Any questions? On anything so far? Yes? And just a comment about the one woman who was left in your closet. It would have been me. One <laughs> of the seven times the book was assigned to me to read, simply because it aggravated and frustrated me so much, I wanted to know what it was really about. Oh, so that's great. You just told me the answer. <laughs> well, I don't know. Finally. Because, you know, there are, there are many, many, many ways to look at this book, and yeah. I think great books often have that kind of odd um, uh, ambiguity about them. I think one of the reasons that we keep coming back to a book like this, that I can have read it, I don't even know how many times, is that I can't ever quite hold on to what it is. So there are people who believe this is a book about fa the spread of fascism, you know, or authoritarian, the authoritarian rule, well, I mean, can be read at, that way, but was really about the westward expansion and our taking over of this country. Um, my husband has a ha, has a theory that this is about the banking system. Mm. That you know, there's a whole school of thought that this is about the development of the banking system in the U.S. and the way that um, that uh, because that's what the way the way that people had to not get their money right away. And that's what, obviously what happened to Melville's family. And so he's also, that's another one. The, um, we have a very good friend who's a retired rabbi, and his belief is really that this is the Old Testament retold mm -hmm. from the point of view of, you know, 
Mobius as the as the unpredictable and um, and uh, not always kind Old Testament God, and so all of those things are true. But I think for those of us who have struggled to find our way through the book, feeling this feeling is an important way to approach it. So that you know, that's I just think it's a it's a good way in. Um, yeah, it's a good way in. Uh, so, two more things I want to talk about. One is the um, the uh, the stuff that we never read in the marathon, and I understand why we don't read it. But so, when you start this book, if you have a decent edition, which I hope you do, um, because I think some of the there are editions where this uh, where this book. Uh, doesn't have its front matter, but the book is dedicated to Nathaniel Hawthorne. And then the next thing that happens is there's a thing called the etymology. We don't read. We don't read that. We always start with Call Me Ishmael, right? We do start there, but some marathons do start with the e extracts. But yeah. yeah. So the etymology, uh, which is you know, etymology is the study of the origin of words and the way that uh, the way in which their meanings change throughout history. And um, basically, what Melville has here is is the etymology of the word whale in all different languages. He wants us to know that the whale is not something that he's the only person who met. You know, he wants us to know that the whale matters and has significance all over the world. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I don't know about those people, are they? Should we? They're, oh. <laughs> They're curious. They're, uh, oh, oh, okay. They just keep going back and forth <laughs> across the door. Okay, and then, here they go. <laughs> and then there are approximately, um, I don't know, 15 or 15 pages of extracts from different texts about whaling. And it's everything from, uh, it's everything from uh, Genesis, the book of Job, Jonah, a bunch of Hamlet, uh, a Paradise Lost, uh, a Voyage to Greenland, uh, Edmund Burke, um, Uh, just, just uh, I don't know, people that you know, people that you don't know, books that you know, books that you don't know, and it ends with a whale song, which is, oh, the rare old whale, mid storm and gale, in his ocean home will be a giant in might, where might is right, and king of the boundless sea. And so, in a way, what Melville, what Melville Ishmael is doing is he's, He's showing us that in this world that he doesn't understand, in this, at the, after this event that he doesn't understand, he's doing all the research he can possibly do to make sense of this thing that happened to him. And one of the things he's done is he's found every place in literature, in history, in science, where the whale exists so that we can look at the whale and say, is that the reason that I survived? Is that the reason I survived? I know this about the whale. Is that why I'm the one who survived? And so that's that. This whole um, etymology and extract is really a way of opening the book and saying, "Oh, this book is about everything. There's nothing off limits. There's nothing that can't be a subject of this book." Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's it's very ironic that I'm sure those materials were in the first edition. Yes. Right, public. But what was not in the first edition were the closing pages right. where the whole, all the plot happens and, you know, we never find out that he's the, full, the final, the only survivor. I know, which is crazy. Yeah, which is really, really crazy in light of the perspective and weight you put on that understanding now. Yeah. But uh, it's also an explanation for why they say only 3,700 30, copies were sold. People are you know, some people, like myself, turn to the back of the book first thing right. to see what's going on. Right. <laughs> Nothing there. Right, right. right. So, but I thought it's, it's tre tremendously ironic that these materials that in the front 
which really uh, set up his perspective <coughs> and and lay out the roadmap for right. where the, the trip he's taking he's going to take you on was was preserved. It could have easily <coughs> have been yes. not that. Yeah, I mean there's a I mean I think there's a good publishing marketing decision called let's get rid of all this junk at the front. It doesn't mean anything, but I I actually think it means an enormous amount. It's really this desperate person trying to prove some point to find some meaning. And he's like, is it here? Is it in Hamlet? Is it, you know, in Scoresby? Where is it? Do you know? And um, and he doesn't know, so he keeps he keeps writing, you know. And um, and he really, uh, you know, he he really. If you look at the, if you think about the piece of his life that I talked about, that five years, you know, to be 20 to 25 is pretty young to be off on your own, trying to support yourself, you know, trying to make a life for yourself and going from, you know, all over the world and having all these kinds of terrifically strange experiences and then coming back and saying like, oh, I'm just going to sit here for the rest of my life and be a writer. And he still hasn't made sense of it here. In fact, this is the book where he starts to really tackle um, the big questions of what his life means to him. Like, I'm sure he saw a lot of death. <coughs> so, other questions? Yes? I was curious. Like in answering your own question, seeing you, I would assume work with different generations of students. Yeah. Um, you, would, you know, I have my own ideas, but in terms of why, you know, theoretically women find it tough. I mean, maybe what what your younger students. I mean, I'm sure you've gotten some feedback. It seems very like not like very representative, maybe with the kind of point of view being very male centric. I mean. Well, what is the feedback yeah. from your younger students? It's not even that it's male centric. There's there, there there's one lady who serves a cup of chowder, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in the book. Right. You know, she seems nice. I, mean, I, I was, you know, I was, I was, uh, I was joking the other day because when he describes her, he describes her as having yellow hair and wearing a yellow dress. Like that's that's everything we know about her. Like maybe she has an eye color too. I don't remember, but it's like it's literally. He doesn't see her, but when I don't, I don't feel with my younger students that they are necessarily different from my older students in what they are willing or not willing to take from this book. So, but I do think that we overall, and I would be curious what you think, you guys think about this, but like, I think we're very. Um, we have a lot of rules about narrative that um, were invented pretty much in our lifetimes or in the kind of last hundred years about what a story should be and how a story should solve the problems that it sets up. And so we're very much more, and I'm a way a fan of like Jane Austen or George Eliot, you know, I'm a super fan. Not criticizing them at all, but we are really interested in resolution. We are really interested in um, uh, in uh, some version of form follows.